the tech is brought to you by slack slack is a messaging app which brings together all your team's communication into one place making work simpler and more productive go to slack.com to learn more Everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarin. Of course, I'm joined by Mr. Paul Thorat. How are you doing, Paul? Pretty good. Uh, the first you? show of 2019 for us. Yeah, it feels like it's March. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, it's like the second week of January. We uh, we took off for a couple of weeks. We took, I think, two weeks off. It feels like it was mm-hmm. a lot longer. Uh, the holidays yeah. are so brutal, especially, you know, to kind of... And, and it, it fell, you know, New Year's Day and Christmas fell on That's a right. Tuesday. So it kind of affected the way that we do shows. But we said, you know what? Let's not stress over the holidays. Everybody's a lot of stuff is happening. Everybody's moving. So we decided to take two weeks off and come back. And it's a great week to come back because it is uh, CES week. And today, a lot of these NDAs are getting released. And a lot of this information is coming out today. So Mm -hmm. I thought it would be nice to do like a little CES preview on top of all the other things that are going on in tech. Obviously, there was two weeks that we missed. Um, we right. actually left with a bang because uh, we broke some news on the show uh, for Microsoft's inadvertently. plan inadvertently, uh, and it actually got picked up everywhere, um, which I predicted. I thought I, I said we may have made a boo boo again. Uh, but I was confused picked- by this. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> that it got picked up everywhere. Well, Brad picked me, and he's like, "Are you going to write about this or not?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And he's like, "Everyone's publishing stories about this thing you wrote." Or said on the podcast, and I was like, "Oh, Jesus!" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, I guess I'll. Write you know it. what's amazing though? Did you get reached out by anybody to clarify anything you said? This, yeah, I mean, um, this is a good example of this kind of thing because what I wrote was very specific, and um, I was able to confirm it with a second source, right? Which is part of the the whole process for me, anyway, and. Um, I always write very specifically what I know to be true, you know, Yeah. whether it be the, you know, whatever. And um, people always ask about like, well, what about this or what, well, will it do this? And it's like, guys, I don't keep little secrets out, <laughs> like, or at least that I can talk about. Like um, I, what, what I know is in the post, you know, and it's, if it's vague in certain ways, it's because I just don't know, you know? Yeah. Um, I, um, I, there was one story that got published. I'm not going to, I'm not going to call them out because they did the right thing. They totally, uh, they totally got the story wrong. They reported it very inaccurately. So I actually yeah. reached out to the guy. I'm like, dude, you did you even listen to the video? And he goes, what video? Oh, jeez. And so he like based it on a story written based by someone on a, who would listen to the video, and yeah, he based Welcome it on a story that was a jerk that is the internet. Yeah, he based it on a story that was written by somebody that was written by somebody that was written by somebody that actually saw the video. That's what it was. Sure. And so I was like, that's not game. what we said. We didn't, we never said yep. that. Uh, and what was it? It was, um, essentially he said that th- there are three cameras and the PC one will not be compatible with the Xbox one. And I, I actually asked him, I'm like, did you, where did you clarify this? And he goes, oh, from the, from the, the rod article. I go, no, that's not true at all. Cause I'm in it. He had no idea who I was. He never even saw the article. Right, right, he just right. based it on somebody else. So I, I, I must You were the like, first person that tipped me off to this. I was, I, I was, didn't and it was right in the article. But just so people understand, your information caused me to go and check to see if it was true, and I found out that it was. Yeah, imagine if I totally made it up. What a clairvoyant I am. <laughs> well, that, I mean, look, if you're going to make something up, um, this is a little bit of uh, advice. Not that yeah. I make things up, but it seems based based on my experience as a reporter, I will say this. Uh, don't be specific. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I was very specific. Uh, it's like because... when you're reading palms, you know, you ask questions and then you say things that are kind of general and they think you're a genius, but don't, yeah. don't get specific. Yeah. No, uh, I got, I got actually got tipped off by a friend of ours, a, a fan of the show that works for Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, he tipped me off and he said, yeah. don't mention that I work for Microsoft. So I just blew your cover. I'm so sorry. Right. <laughs> cool. Uh, we do have so much to talk about. Uh, I'm, I feel good about this year. I'm in a good mood. Paul's in a great mood. You could tell. Just look at his face. He's so happy right now to be here. Uh, so we do have a lot to talk about, obviously, and a whole lot more. Obviously, the new year is starting fresh, and 
I'm big on getting organized in the new year. I do this every year. I start getting organized and what I'm doing and how I'm planning my life and my business. And Slack is a pivotal point of that. Uh, it's a collaboration hub that lets you organize your team's work in easy, searchable channels. Uh, so whether you're in, uh, whether it's projects or interests or teams or by office, all the right people are always in the loop. And this is a major problem that I've had in almost every company I've ever worked for, where certain departments know things and the other ones are not really told in time. And it causes a major problem when it's, you know, the day to execute. Uh, you could obviously learn more. This is where work happens at slack.com. Now, something that I do with Slack is real-time messaging and organizing your team. So what I've done with GFQ is that I have a what the tech section and I have a Matt men section and I have the editors and I have social people and I individually talk to everybody to keep their programs in the loop. And I also have a master channel now where if it's a, if it's a general point, like, Hey, we're not doing shows on Tuesday. Everybody gets it, which is great. Uh, this has been instrumental in many companies that I know many companies around the world use this. Also, it's, uh, totally, uh, easily, integrated with Zendesk, Salesforce, Google Drive, and over a thousand apps. To find out more, go to slack.com. That's slack.com where work happens. Uh, Paul, where would you like to start this year? Because I, I always start the conversation every year, but I want you to start something this year. I want you to tell me what we're talking yeah. about. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, one week ago today, maybe, or maybe it was tomorrow, um, we received our first blockbuster news of the year. And I think it's worth discussing, which is that Apple warned that its earnings for the current quarter or the quarter that just ended December 31st, I guess, will be anywhere from five to $10 billion less than expected because of worse than expected iPhone sales. Um, hmm. I, the reason I want to discuss this is because virtually everything that Tim Cook put into his overly worded, wordy, open letter to investors was deceptive or downright lies. And yeah. it is astonishing to me that when Apple communicates stuff like this, that fewer people call them on this kind of stuff. So I have seen a few reports that have gone into some detail about why what he wrote is nonsense. Um, I just like to cover some of the highlights because this is a company that has routinely given conservative estimates so that they can blow past those estimates every quarter and look like heroes. But it's also a company that is humongous and has deep ties into the, the, you know, the industry, into the supply industry and so forth, into the markets in which they sell. They, they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, it is incredible that this company claims that factors that had been in place for months and in many cases, years suddenly came to a head and China and surprise them, you know, um, the, the, some of the factors that they say, like, first of all, uh, the iPhone sale problem is not just China. They kept saying China, 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 but if you kind of read but what they write, you actually, it's not just China. Um, they're having iPhone sales problems everywhere, just like the rest of the industry. I mean, and that's the other thing, you know, the, the, this, uh, peak iPhone, as we call it, the and peak iPhone is not necessarily total sales in a quarter or a year, but rather growth. Uh, stopped. It happened about two years ago. Actually, now it's almost two and a half years ago. Um, meaning that since that time, iPhones have not grown or in some cases sold as well as their predecessors in any given quarter. It's We've crested the wave. You know, it's it's over. Um, so this is not a new phenomena. The, the notion that uh, Apple announced, for example, in this past quarter that they were going to stop reporting unit sales. You only do that when you've been bragging about unit sales for years, when those numbers don't look at it good anymore. It sort of proves they knew this was coming. Um, the China problem, like the um, the trade war, uh, didn't suddenly happen in December. <laughs> this has been an ongoing issue. In fact, if anything, you could make an argument that the trade relations between China and the United States actually improved over the course of the quarter, but whatever. Um, they talked about carrier subsidies. That ended years ago. Apple created its own subsidy program called the iPhone Upgrade Program two years ago, maybe three, I don't remember now, specifically to address the need to roll the cost of an iPhone into your monthly bill. Um, it is incredible nonsense. With, with their reach into 
what's happening in the market for them to claim now that this was a surprise can only be one of two things. They're lying, which is what I think, or they are the most inept executive uh, executive team in the history of U S corporations. Like I, I it's, it's inconceivable. It's, it's not possible, right? It's what they're saying is not possibly true. And I, I'm astonished. Like I said earlier, that fewer people uh, are that not more people are calling them on this. It is so obvious, you know? So I, anyway. So he, but, here's uh, my question to you. Here, here's a yeah. question. Um, they're not the only ones that are, uh, Samsung also right. released bad, earn, yep. you know, so, uh, by forecasted way, earnings. Samsung did it earlier this year. In mid, I'd have to go look it up now, but sometime in the middle of 2018, Samsung said, hey, by the way, things aren't going as well as we thought they were going to go. When they announced the Note uh, 8, right, the Note 8, yeah, in August, I actually went back and wrote about this somewhere. You can find this on my site somewhere. The CEO of Samsung made an incredible statement on stage where he said, you know, I got to be honest, it's getting harder every year to come up with new features. Um, he's like, we're trying as hard as we can. It, yeah. It's such a weird, like when you're, when you're announcing a new product, you, are, you don't ever suggest to the world that this isn't awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. you know, if you look at how Apple announces things, they do it right. It, it, you know, I kind of call them on it because it's such crazy hyperbole, but they'll always say, God, this thing makes the thing we were selling last year look like crap. I don't know why anyone would have wanted that because this is the best iPhone we've ever made by far. The CEO of Samsung, after an incredible event, stood up on that stage and said, you know, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. I, I know a lot of people will look at this and say, yeah, it's the same thing as the one we made a year ago, a couple of new features. Um, you know, it's a hard position to be in. So I give them credit for being a little more transparent, maybe a lot more transparent than Apple certainly more honest. Um, and, and they have, their story has never changed this Apple thing. Um, there's already talk of, uh, crap class, class action lawsuits because they have, they've lied to investors. <laughs> this is actually against the law. It, the notion that Apple was surprised by this is unbelievable. And I mean that term literally it's not believable. So is it, is it that, let, let's over, you know, let's let's look yeah. at the PC market in general. Is it that mm -hmm. uh, uh, the mobile market? The mobile market's slowing down. I mean that 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 yep. to me, is, I mean that's a sign of things. Yep. We're not right. we're not getting new phone. People are not buying new phones every year or two years even. And when you have a product that's eleven hundred dollars, yeah, I'm well, now but, thinking okay, so twice. Two things to, to what you just said. Uh, one of them is relates to what I said earlier, which is that they knew about this. This notion that people are not buying iPhones as frequently, like upgraders, also not new. This is not new. This is, Apple had this data. They knew they knew this was happening. They know it's probably still going to get worse. People went from two years to three years. It might go to four years, right? Uh, Apple in mid-year announced, hold on, I gotta, let me get rid of the chat, um, that they were for the first time ever going to release an iOS version that would make previous devices run faster. Apple had to that date specifically designed iOS so that it would make your device worse. I, I your older device. I don't mean that they put code in that said, if running iPhone seven, make this thing 50% slower. I don't mean it like that. I mean that they never bothered to optimize it on the older devices. They specifically optimized every single version of iOS for only the new devices. And this is a plan to get people to upgrade faster. Now, given the market conditions, given the way things have been going, given the slowing down of the smartphone industry that you just mentioned, Apple this year said, we can't keep doing this. We have to make iOS work better on older devices. So for the first time ever, literally in 12 versions, the only time they've ever done this. Actually, that's not technically true, <laughs> but we'll say one of the very few times, some of the early versions of iPhone OS or iOS uh, obviously had to take into account older versions, but they stopped doing that to drive the update upgrade cycle once iPhone became a, you know, a big thing. Um, why would they do this, right? Why, why would Apple, you, you could make this argument like it would be better for Apple if people just bought more iPhones. That's how they make money. And the answer to that question is yes, of course it would. But now that's not happening. That's why they did this. It has nothing to do with being altruistic or being good to their customers or anything. Well, no, actually, it does not. have to do with being good. The reason they did it was they know that the smartphone market is flattening, could even 
shrink a little bit. It's going to have a rocky several years. Their customer base is their customer base. It's probably not going up. We need to eke as much money out of these guys as we can. Well, you can't do that if you're pissing them off by not making their existing device work well. Because the way you're going to make more money from those guys is to sell them services like iCloud storage, like this Apple Music thing that's out now, or the coming Apple TV thing that's coming out soon. If you have unhappy customers, they're they're going to say, well, I, I can't upgrade to a new phone, so I'm going to switch to Android because it's a lot cheaper. And I'm going to leave your eco, or I'm going to stop spending money on your ecosystem, and then it's over. Well, I mean that that hits the nail on the head right now, right? Because we're seeing at CES, especially, uh, Apple is allowing AirPlay two uh, enabled uh, Samsung TVs. They're they're, <laughs> so they're letting you are now going to be able to do AirPlay. You don't yeah. need an Apple TV. Also, iTunes right. is now going to be listed in the Samsung store. Um, Right. Is this their transition to be more of a services company? This so, kind of goes into the prediction. Yeah, By the well, way, during a prediction show, somebody said, "Are we going to see? Uh, are we going to see yeah. uh, I, I, I message on Android?" And it's right. possible now. This is this is a huge topic, Andrew. It's like it's 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 hard to to get on top of everything that's going on here. So a couple of things. Um, this notion of Apple putting its stuff on other platforms is not new, right? So um, in uh, 2001, I think it was, 2002, whatever year, uh, they moved uh, iTunes to Windows, right? Because it was the only way that the iPod was ever going to be successful. They had to. Apple is a company that hates partnering. They like <laughs> to replace partners and get rid of them. And they don't like to prop up competitors, right? But they only do it when they have to. They had to do it with iTunes in whatever year that was. They had to do it with Safari. And then that didn't work, but they tried that. It was available on Windows for a little while. More recently, they've done it with Apple Music. Uh, they put it on Android. Why on earth would you, you know, and, and, you know, they can make all the excuses they want. Well, we want to give people a good Apple experience and maybe if they like it, they'll go buy an iPhone. Yeah, maybe, uh, probably not, but okay, cool. Um, that might be why they might do something like that for iPhone, which by the way, I think is a great idea. Um, it's why they're putting iTunes and AirPlay 2, not just on Samsung TVs, by the way, but a bunch of different kinds of TVs. I know LG is one of the companies on the list as well. Um, the Samsung thing was big news because it was like the first one. Um, Apple has not changed its stripes, right? This is a company that is actively working to erase every partner it has as quickly as it can and always has. And that's hardware, software services, no matter what it is. They, they, this is the one thing that they've always remained true to. These exceptions... I don't want to call it desperation, but it's just a market reality. They, they've they finally hit a wall. This thing they want is is not going to grow unless we do this thing. And they, okay, we're going to do this thing. Um, when you think about home entertainment and music specifically, but also soon video, and what a focus this is for Apple and how this could impact their bottom line when it comes to their services revenue. There's all kinds of different ways we can enjoy entertainment in our home digitally, right? And we have things like Chromecast and Sonos and we have Roku's and Apple TVs and whatever. Um, the least ubiquitous of all of this stuff is Apple's, right? And when I get onto like a, like a Roku, I can get Google stuff on there. I can get Amazon stuff on there. It's like, it's everything but Apple, you know? And I will, I will predict now based on what happened this week at CES that unless something really changes at Apple, this stuff that we're seeing on the Samsung and the LG TVs and probably on others is going to happen on different set-top boxes as well. Uh, they made a deal with Amazon late last year to bring their devices back to the Amazon uh, web store. Well, what if we? I, why wouldn't they bring iTunes and AirPlay to, to the Fire TV and to those devices? Why wouldn't they bring them yeah. to Roku? So he, here's um, a prediction. I'm going to give you a little yeah. prediction. Um, uh, because I'm getting bombarded now with speculation on i on iMessage and their messages app and uh, on Android. So Apple is kind of they're, they're all, they've always been a services company, but they're transitioning now because this is what it kind of looks like in 2019 to become more of a open up their services to other platforms. And the question now is why would they release their message app, the messages app, on Android? Where do they benefit from this? How does that help them with sales? And I'll tell you how. They have an opportunity with with the way that message the messages app has gone and and uh, over the years they have all these crazy add-ons and gifts and all this. What they're gonna do? They're gonna make they're gonna open up iMessage, 
or, or messages now, right? It's not iMessage anymore. Yeah. They're going to open yeah, up anyway. messages and they're going to put it on Android. And now they're going to charge you if you want the whatever, the Beyonce <laughs> emoji, or you want the, mm-hmm. the, the, the office gifts, you're going to pay, you know, 99 cents for a pack. Or you're gonna, I'm telling you that that's going to sure. be their platform and they're going to make a killing out of it because this is where all these companies are going, where you're going to have premium right. uh, add-ons to the message service. And you're going to see in, in that quarter, the final quarter that they release, they're going to say, well, look at this. We, we generated, you know, $20 million in our messages service alone. And, and this will just plump up their services business. This is the future. This is what I yeah. see them doing. And it's not a dumb I, decision by them. No. Well, the only thing dumb about it is that it hasn't happened yet, right? So <laughs> yeah. Apple has allowed the situation to get so bad that it now, in an act of near desperation, is working on these things that we know about and maybe some of these things that we're speculating about you know um I, look i don't have as much insight into apple like i did i do or did at microsoft for sure but i i know from disastrous parodic launches like windows 8 and windows rt how these kinds of things work and i'm sorry like D- apple is very much a data-driven company they know exactly what to expect from these kinds of events and you have to think that in september or whenever that was when the pre-orders went up for the xs with tennis that they were like, Oh boy. Yeah. Uh Oh, <laughs> you know, and uh, there's all kinds of analysis and explanation and blah, 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 whatever. But the, the issue I have is that this should have been obvious. And you also mentioned earlier, the price hike thing, Apple raised its prices by about 20% across the board last year. Um, I, I <laughs> you know, I, I look the iPhone 10 S and 10 S max and the, Actually, the 10R as well are they're fantastic. They are fantastic, um, but they don't DXR. exist in a vacuum. And what DXR, uh, right? Is yeah, because you, you broke up. Okay, it's 10R, right? They call it 10R. Don't they say 10? A 10R, yeah, 10R, yeah. right. yeah. 10R. So, which by the way, they got to get rid of the Roman, Roman normal thing. Stupid, really stupid. Especially when you mix it with a normal letter. So it's like. With the X, we say 10, but with the S, we say S. <laughs> like, so I, I realize S isn't the Roman numeral, but I mean, that's that whole thing is stupid. They got to fix that. But um, but look, they, they they knew this, right? So th- there's some math to be had. You sell some tens of millions of phones every quarter. Um, the sales seem to be flatlining or maybe they're declining a bit. We know we have a loyal user base. How much can we raise the prices to make up the difference when it comes to revenues? Uh, it's like 20%. You know, but yeah. but the two fa- obviously didn't work, right? So it wasn't it didn't work, and the reason this twofold, one is for a lot of people who are coming from a phone that was a year old or two years old, it's not that much of an upgrade, and and in this case, it's kind of a dicey upgrade because there is the uncertainty or even the dislike of new features like Face ID, which some people would prefer the the touch button thing that they had before, but the other problem they have, and this is especially true in China. Not just China, though. Like I said earlier, it's true, very much uh, throughout Asia and Western Europe in particular is the surge in quality of uh, handsets from Chinese companies like yeah. Huawei and Xiaomi. And I'm actually, I've got a, um, a Huawei a Mate 20 Pro I've been using for the past couple of weeks. Is that the one with 18 cameras, Paul? It has three cameras. <laughs> okay. It's uh, You could actually take 40-something megapixel shots with this if you wanted to. Um, I have it set on a lower setting, but it this is the nicest handset I have ever used in my entire life, yeah. and it is no contest. By the way, like, I, I just put in the is, I just put in the uh, the Mate Twenty, and yeah. I, well, it's I, Mate Twenty I, Pro, so there's Mate Twenty there's Pro, a Mate Twenty Pro. Yeah. So this is the article. <laughs> Boy Genius Report has this as the headline, right? He goes, "The stunning smartphone Trump won't let you buy is on Amazon, the and way less compared to the iPhone." <laughs> Like, let's hit all the points. It's banned. It's Trump, and it's on Amazon. And I'm using my Amazon affiliate link on on Boy Genius Report. To nice, buy this. nice. Let's hit all the. By the way, thousand uh, dollars this phone. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, it's gorgeous. You know, um, it's a really nice phone. And this is oh, and uh, in China though, this these phones that Huawei sells and Xiaomi sells and Oppo sells, or whatever are often uh, several hundred dollars less expensive than an Oh, iPhone. it is. And there's, there's a lot of, yeah. um, you know, uh, there's a thing that, I, look, again, Apple is this gigantic company. They, they understand this. I, I mean, I'm just like a guy. I don't understand economics or cost of goods or anything like that. But 
you know, when the, uh, you know, whatever the, what do you call it? Like gross pay of a average person in the countries of America and China are combined or uh, compared China is for all of its growth and for all of the explosive awesomeness is like one sixth the United States. Now I'm not saying that the iPhone should sell for one sixth of what it costs, you know, there, but it needs to be lower. They just can't afford mm-hmm. it. And where at one point there was some group of elites who were buying these phones because it was a status symbol or whatever, that time has passed. And and to the Chinese consumer, these new phones, often from Chinese companies, are better looking. They have much better feature sets and more stuff going on. That they, They're more uh, localized to their market, which is a big problem with actually all smartphones, really, um, except for Chinese ones, of course, because they're in China. And uh, they're less expensive, you know. And so... You know, Apple was a was a passing fad in the single biggest consumer electronics market on earth. Yeah, amazing, right? Huge problem to claim. I'm not. No one's saying they're doomed. You know, the the Titanic doesn't sink instantly. It's humongous. It takes a while, and they could they could figure out something. I'm not. I don't. I don't want to forget that. I mean, I and I don't want that not to be part of the conversation. But the people who immediately kind of reject this notion that Apple is doomed is like kind of a knee jerk thing, and it's like no, 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 no. It's like guys. This is a one product company. They literally get 70 something percent of their revenues from this one product and the services that support it. Literally. If this thing goes away, Apple becomes the size of Netflix or Roku or Hulu or like some stupid little company nobody cares about. Yeah. It, the phone market is gigantic. It, it's I mean, a it's, problem. So here's the thing you hit the nail. It's not going away. Uh, there's no. No. Uh, the, no, it's like you can't iOS is iOS. without people saying, oh, you know, you want it to be doomed. You're like happy it's going away. No, no. I would never want it to be doomed no. because you know why? It creates well, competition. All, like I said, those products are great. They're great. They're too expensive. It, you know, it's it, the, the thing I would say about the uh, the MacBook Air, which I, by the way, I bought with my own money, uh, is the same thing I would say about these new iPhones. This is a beautiful computer. In the MacBook Air's case, it's 200 bucks too too expensive. In the case of a, uh, an iPhone, maybe it's 100 bucks or 150 bucks, whatever the difference is. But it's it's there's always that but you know there's always that's always been the case with Apple. It's worse today. Beautiful, but it's too expensive. But listen, and today, same, now same goes for Samsung, right? Same goes for Samsung. Also, Samsung flagship devices are too expensive compared to the Chinese ones. Yes, compared I mean, to the Chinese ones. Honestly, yeah. here in the here in the United States, like you could get a. Uh, well, they're almost going to be replaced, but the uh, Samsung Galaxy S9, S9 Plus, or Note 9. I said Note 8 earlier. I guess I meant, I meant Note 9. Um, for hundreds of dollars less than the Apple equivalent, right? The problem for them is the same in China as it is for Apple because you can still get a Huawei or a Xiaomi or a Oppo or whatever. Uh, Honor, which is another brand uh, made by, I think, by Huawei, um, for hundreds less. Yeah. Listen, so, but, but yeah. here's the argument Simple. for Apple, though. Here's a great argument. Okay, fine. Our phone is twelve hundred dollars, but give me another, <laughs> give me another manufacturer that you could get iOS on. You can't. It's impossible. But uh, for Samsung, yeah. the argument is, you know what? You can get yeah. Android on any of these devices, and it's it's overall, uh, primarily, well, it'll be the same experience on a high end Huawei as you will get on the Samsung S nine plus. Well, just so by the way, the components not will be exactly, a little different. Right? Not exactly. So they do run the same apps and they run the same services for the most part. Um, two things to the Apple. You see, again, like every time you say anything, it's like it's an explosion of things. I mean, this, this, like I said, it's a huge topic. Um, a- iOS can't be had on other devices. That was Apple's decision, right? I mean, they've always decided we're, you know, that's their, we don't, we don't partner. So they're, they're going alone strategy. If, if an Apple fan says, yeah, but you can buy all these cheap, yeah. Apple decided not to compete, you know, in the same way as Android. That that was their decision. They, you can't use that as a crutch. That was their decision. That's their fault. So that's one thing. But, you know, the Android thing is interesting because... It was their advantage, Paul. Yeah. It was their advantage to lock <laughs> sure. you in. Sure. I, well, okay, but so now you can't bitch when it's not working. It's like China was the was the reason for all of the great iPhone growth over the past two or three years or whatever it was. Well, now that's going away. Well, you can't complain. You you cheered it when it was working. I mean, now it's not. You, you can't. The sword has two edges. You can't just take the but good. Wait, that, that's, it's not just Apple. It's a lot of companies. A lot of a lot of Western based companies saw China when their when their yes. growth kind of plateaued a little bit. Yes. They saw China as the new front. Netflix was another one. And the, the especially for services businesses, 
uh, the Asian market generally does not care for subscription services. That has been well, so, uh, over the last right. three, four years. We've seen um, on, on the wrestling side, the WWE Network went there. A lot of pay-per-view providers have attempted to enter but, China, the Chinese <laughs> market. They don't want it. Andrew, you're racing ahead. So hold on. Let's go back because we, we got to go back to something you said earlier because this is important to what you're saying now. Um, you were talking about Android and how you can get the same experience everywhere. And the truth is actually you can't, right? So a Samsung version of Android is very different from a Huawei version of Android, which is very different from a stock Google, you know, pixel version of Android, right? So they run the same apps, but the truth is these things are actually different from a user experience. Standpoint. Uh, you're right. Let me, I'll correct myself. Are, you're absolutely right. Well, I know, but I, this is an important, actually, this is an important distinction, especially for China. The reason that Huawei and Xiaomi and these other companies are becoming very successful, aside from the hardware is awesome, right? Is that they are specifically building user experiences for the Chinese market, right? That's the thing that Apple does very poorly. I don't know how well Google or Samsung does this, but it is a fact that Samsung as well as Google, uh, Apple is being shut out of that market increasingly. This is part of it. So you can't just say, well, Android's as good as uh, iOS, which is my opinion, and I wrote an article about that. Um, the hardware is just as good, which is absolutely the case. Um, the innovation you see in cameras and sensors and AI and blah, 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 it's the same or is good, whatever. Yep. But the reason these things are, the real reason is for, that has to happen before they can compete. But the reason these companies take over in their own market is because they're specifically targeting the needs and wants of the people in that market. That's something Apple has utterly failed at. And it's super important. So when the thing that you just said about, I re remember exactly, Netflix, I think, and WWE, uh, which I still think of as WWF, and that freaks me out, but whatever. How is, dare you? <laughs> I know. Get with the program. Um, I know, I'm old. Um, <laughs> is It's the same problem, right? You've got this, uh, you've got this essentially American product that, by the way, translates really well to Western Europe, which is another huge market. It's huge. very similar. Um, the, the cultural difference between Europe and the United States, by and large, is actually pretty small, especially when you compare it to the cultural difference with Asia and China in particular. You know, And so you, you'll get, uh, when there is no homegrown or uh, localized equivalent, you're going to get a certain amount of sales in these markets because it's a, an affluence thing. It's a aspirational thing. It's a well-respected global brand. Uh, but these companies in China haven't just caught up, caught, caught up, <laughs> geez, haven't just caught up. Hey, you're speaking they like you're surpassed. from Queens now, Paul. I know, jeez. <laughs> it, it's spreading I'm not over even the drinking. internet. Um, no, um, it, professional but... speaker, Paul Thrott. Um, Yes. So. <laughs> uh, no, you're, you're oh, absolutely boy. right. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, um, yeah, I think we took a different spin on, on the show that we were planning, but I think that's a great conversation. <laughs> um, so you, the, you told me I could go first. I know, I know, I know. No, it's great. It's great. I love it. Um, uh, there's a lot of assumption on the Chinese market, right? And I was talking to someone brilliant and he, and he studies this and he said, you know, Western culture sees China and they see billions of people and they say, wow, this is an untapped resource of, of consumers. Consumerism is, is booming right now in China. Capitalism right. is booming in China. But the percentage of people that are consumerist and that are uh, subscribed to that belief yep. are very low compared to the United States because there's a tremendous wage gap between the high, you yeah. know, the the That's upper right. class and the, mid, the the middle class of China. There's a tremendous gap. The rich are rich and the poor are kind of poor, and then the other ones are somewhere in the middle. Uh, it, the the living standard, uh, the 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 living standard when it comes to spending money is very different. The mentality is very different because remember, this was um, this is a brand new emerging market. Obviously, there right. there were, were there were superpower, but it, it's still it, we have this false idea. That it's a capitalistic market and everybody thinks like Americans, where every every home has or a that plasma it's TV. Comparable. In it. It's you know, there's a huge gap in wealth between the wealthiest, you know, whatever percent in the United States and the mass, you know, the masses. It that's a huge problem here. It's an even bigger problem in China, like you said. The other thing is China's is kind of the end of the line because obviously, uh, just talking about uh, markets of people who can buy things, China's, you know, like I said, it's the, it's the biggest market in the world. Well, what's What's after China? The thing that the only obvious thing is India, yeah. right? India has billions of people. India is way poorer than China. So as bad as China may look economically compared to the United States, India is again as bad compared to China. So you're hitting kind of diminishing returns. 
um, a company like Apple, who are, which is the primary focus here, which is selling very expensive new handsets, had, had this little bubble in China because there is an affluent class. Well, there probably is in India too, but it's much smaller. And for those guys who are, I don't know what they're, you know, I made up numbers earlier, but I think I said something like, I don't know what I said. It doesn't matter. Some, you know, one sixth or something of the, uh, you know, average, you know, uh, salary or whatever it might be. It, it it's, it's comparatively tiny. So there are, I'm sure there are billions of people in Africa. There are probably billions of people in uh, sure. rural South America or whatever outside of the big cities. And yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm sure we have a goal to sell phones to these people and we are selling phones to these people. They're not going to be $1,200 iPhone max X, you know, 10 S maxes. Like, yeah, <laughs> this is a non-starter. Yeah. It's a, so very Apple, interesting, yeah, listen, it's a very interesting uh, year for Apple and Samsung and all, all the yeah. top manufacturers. We're, we're seeing a change. And by the way, Google does this too. Uh, Samsung does this. All oh, everybody does this at this point. And now we have hitch hit a plateau with uh well, with the way that this goes <laughs> at this point we, we've reached samsung to be fair has a, a very diversified smartphone lineup you know um one of the things an apple guy would have said a couple of years ago i you know you might you'd make the statement well samsung outsells iphone by some whatever margin 25 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent, whatever it is and then the apple guy would say well yeah but they sell all these really cheap phones it's not really fair again Samsung goes to market the way they want to. Apple goes to the market they want to. These things are comparable. I'm sorry. Uh, that's too bad. Now we're on the flip side of this argument, though, because this strategy is, is going to help them weather this storm better than Apple can because Apple only sells high-end phones. Or, you know, you can buy a phone that's two or three years old. If, you know, you can't yeah. afford it because you're poor. Sorry, people. That's the best we can offer you. Um, that's not how people want to be treated, you know? And uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's fair. I mean, look, I mean, an iPhone 8 or something is, I'm sure it's a great phone, whatever. I don't mean any, I don't mean to disparage the device, but you're selling a device. It's not, almost two years old now. Um, still pretty expensive, you know. Um, Google is rumored to be coming out with a mid tier version of the Pixel 3 sometime in the spring. This will probably specifically target uh, emerging markets, right? Listen, I mean, it, maybe it, we'll be able to buy it in the United States, but I think the point of it is to serve this market to people who can't afford flagships. Listen, I, I I'm priced out right now. I mean, uh, listen, I have a I have an iPhone for work and I have a Samsung uh, yeah. S9. But generally, previously, you know, the last like eight years that we've been doing this, if there's a if there's a flagship phone that comes out that I should review, I would buy it. Yeah, I, I can't well, Andrew, justify a twelve hundred dollars spend. I bought and returned several flagship phones this past fall. I learned a lot doing this, right? But you know, Pixel Three, Pixel Three XL. Uh, Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus again for the second time, um, iPhone 10s and 10R. I also got for review. I did pay for these, but like the OnePlus 6T, and then this Huawei phone. Um, I spent thousands of dollars on these things. I returned all of them. I ended up buying, by the way, a used, uh, refurbished iPhone 7 just so I have an iOS device I can test stuff on. 300 bucks or whatever it was. Um, the same position as you. I, I can't really look. I'm not Mr. Moneybags. I don't really, you know, these things aren't improving my life that much. Um, yeah. it's fascinating. Look, it's one of those goofy things. Everyone can say this, you know, maybe the best phone you have is the one that's already in your pocket. And you know, why spend a thousand bucks if you already have something that works? It's, it's obvious, but going through this process as so someone who does review these devices, I can categorically, like none of these things improve my lot in life in the slightest, yeah. you know, um, it is very freeing to have done this and to look back on is I don't need any of these things, you know, and I don't <laughs> well, listen. I that's what don't. most people, that's how normal people think. Maybe we've, we've, it's important uh, to realize this. Yeah. Um, to kind of move on, this it's was, a, I, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed this discussion, by the way, and, and I'm sure we could talk about it and we'll be talking about this, uh, going forward. Uh, like I said, it's, 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 it explodes out into so many different directions. Honestly, there's a lot to be said here. Yeah. But can, it, only have end, can it end with the Illuminati? Can it end with the Illuminati? I am positive that Steve Cook has a seat at that table, and it's the only reason he still has a job. Because let me tell the you Illuminati. something. I, he is he is their version of Steve Ballmer. He took this thing that a founder made, he he blew it out money wise, mm -hmm. but he went nowhere product wise. <laughs> yeah, and he really kind of undermined <laughs> the core asset that the company has. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, hooray for you know Tim Cook and all the money he made. But at you know, it's Apple is not the awesome company. Long term, short term, short term, long term, short term.
That that's that's really short term. Well, they'll be phenomenal. around for the long term now because yeah. of him. But, um, you know, look, and I guess to be fair to Tim Cook, nobody was going to save this thing. I mean, uh, there are no other Steve Jobs waiting in the wings. You know, um, that's the reality. I but I mean, but then again, you know, the the special thing about Steve Jobs was his ability to cut through the crap and say, "That's the thing. Let, let's let's yeah. do more of that." And uh, I don't think the middle manager guy um, is the guy. Yeah. Will ever have that capability. Yeah. Never. Uh, we do have a lot to talk about. Obviously, we're going to kind of go through the rest. But hey, we're going to do a bonus <laughs> show also. It's Tuesday. Paul and I are going to do a bonus show on Patreon. And this is what pays our bills on the show. If you go to patreon.com slash what the tech, you can go fund us there as little as $1 per episode that we do. That's four bucks a month. Uh, and it really is a major, major help to us, you know, continue to do this. Paul and I were having a discussion earlier today. We're going to be doing a lot more content. Uh, we're going to be doing, uh, I, I'm planning on doing the gaming show. I'm trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, we'll figure that out. But also we want to do some live shows here in New York City from the Microsoft store, maybe from another bar. Yep. Since we're refugees at this point, we don't have a home. <laughs> exactly. We lost rattle and hum. <laughs> So we don't yeah. have a home. So maybe from there, uh, there's a lot that we want to do, but you guys are the ones that support this and fund it. If you go to patreon.com slash what the tech, you can fund us there. Uh, I also want to talk about the big story here. And I think it, I think it requires a standing ovation, story. a standing okay. ovation. Dell has removed the nostril cam from their XPS 13, uh, from their XPS lineup. And now yeah. they have put the camera on the top where it belongs. Right, our national nightmare is over. Not the other national nightmare. No, but, not uh, that one. This, this one. Uh, they um, have moved the yeah. camera. Yeah, so I don't know how long the XPS 13 has been around. Five years, maybe more. Something um, it's like It's always that. been maybe a three, beautiful thin light design. It, by the way, it is the machine that kicked off the current big trend in Ultrabooks. It's still going on, which are these ultra-thin bezels, right? Um, one of the ways you get an ultra thin bezel on the top of a screen is not to have a, a webcam there. So yeah. they put it down on the bottom. Um, it was always the wrong decision. And um, now they finally fixed it. Yeah. So uh, they moved it on the, did they move it on the 15 inch or just the 13? I'm actually not sure. Yeah. I assume they're going to move it everywhere. I mean, it, yeah. it, it never, it never made sense for that to be there. Yeah, um, a lot of so let, let's kind of talk about some of the stuff that was announced mm -hmm. uh, for CES and prior to CES. Obviously, Dell has improved a lot of their lines, uh, including the uh, the Inspiron two in one laptops with a new hinge design, the 13 inch. I, I'm I'm very much more interested in this design uh, mm -hmm. for the XPS 13. I'm just curious how good that webcam could possibly be, considering it's a 2.25 <laughs> milligram millimeter you know what? I, webcam. Look, I, if some if there's a person out there who has uh, a need for like professional quality video on a webcam, they'll buy it. Yeah, buy a webcam. You know, um, the the webcam on the new MacBook Air, for example, is nothing special. It's terrible. I mean, it. If you think about it, here, 2018 and now 2019, the, the the notion that we're getting 720p out of a camera is like, it's like buy a you know a Polaroid and take a picture. I mean, it, it's unbelievable how low quality these things can be. Yeah. Um, but if the deal is, you know, you're traveling for work and you want to say good night to your kid at home or uh, you have a, a, the odd work meeting or whatever it is, I mean, who cares? You know, like, it's fine. I mean, I, I think the benefits of the thin and light design kind of outweigh the quality of the cam. But my God, put it, put it up here. Nobody wants to look up your nose. So Lenovo released uh, the next generation ThinkPad line also, they announced. Yeah. And... You know, I absolutely love the ThinkPad line. I've always liked the Lenovo's ThinkPad line. But holy crap, that bottom bezel on these devices? Yep. What is going on I there? I talked to them last year about this. So it's not just them. If you look at any HP, they also have this giant bottom bezel. Why? Um, the reason is it's a 16 by 9 or a 16 by 10 screen. It's probably 16 by 9. And, you know, you want to you want the top bezel to be as thin because you, you, you notice that part of it a lot more than you, the bottom can kind of because it's black and it merges into the display, the uh, keyboard deck kind of gets lost. But yeah, if you pay attention, the the chin, as we'll call it, on most laptop displays is fairly enormous because these companies are all using widescreen displays. Um, I have often made the point that like once you once you go through the XPS 13 thing, which is uh, remember the original approach to this was a 13 inch laptop used to be about whatever size because it was a 13 inch screen 
with like almost an inch bezel on every side. Because we're going to have thin bezels, we can put that 13 inch display in what is essentially a 12 inch laptop body and you save on size and weight. It's better for portability. But once you, once you maximize that, there's nowhere else to go, right? If you want the screen to be 13 inches, you've reached, you know, once you, that's it. You're, you're, you're constricted by the size of the display. But there is one more thing you can do to make that display better, which is to fill up that bezel on the bottom. And the way you do that is by using a three by two display, which by the way, is also better for productivity, Yeah, which I, is exactly the, the, the use cases for the ThinkPad you're citing, the, the HP premium devices, the Dell XPS, whatever. I don't know why these companies don't do this. I, I think um, maybe other than the fact that they're hard to get these parts. Yeah, uh, maybe that's why. Uh, maybe that's probably yeah. why. Um, the other thing that I really like, and what a pretty laptop, is the uh, yeah. the Huawei uh, Mate 13, the MateBook yeah. 13. Now that's a MacBook yeah. MacBook Air clone, right? To, to so, every extent. I mean, the trackpad, the the keyboard layout. It's just missing a touch bar at this point. That's really what it's missing. <laughs> uh, it is one of the. I reviewed the previous version last year. It's one of the best laptops I've ever used in my entire life. Isn't that um, wild? I don't know if that you, is a Huawei? Yeah. Well, surprise, guys. You know, China has gone from being a, a copier where they, well, you're, you're saying they're copying, but I mean, by just by being just a copier, um, but like a low cost, crappy version of something better to products are just as good as the things they're copying, I guess, in this case. Um, I don't know if this is true of the new version, but the MateBook Pro that I reviewed last year also had an up the nose cam that was hidden in a function key. Yeah. So that it's normally up. not remember you would hit the little thing and it would, yeah. would kind of angle up and it's like, okay, it's cute, but I'd rather have it slide up out of the back of the display. Frankly, I don't know why companies don't just do that stupid, like a reverse so, notch kind of thing. Anything else that, that, that was, that's going to be announced at CES that we could talk about. Obviously we're going to see a lot of these and, and I do have a review at the end of the show. I, I want to talk about yeah. the next couple of minutes. I want to talk about the uh, glass by uh, Johnson uh, systems that I've been right. using for a couple months now that I finally uh, I recorded and I kind of mm -hmm. use it every day so I could talk about it. Uh, what I did, I recorded the video and I'm going to talk over it and kind of explain to you guys uh, some of the features and some of the settings and give you guys an overall opinion of what I think about it. But this is yep. something that we're going to see this year a lot at CES are these smart thermostats. Yeah, right. Smart devices in general, right? Smart I mean, devices smart in general. Devices. Yeah, I mean, um, Google said what, a billion devices? devices? Yeah, so I, I, that to me is the other big news. So um, uh, Amazon had in an interview uh, told some publication that there were now 100 million Alexa devices out in the world. And then Google came out with their own blog post and said by the end of this month, there'll be over a billion uh, running on Google Assistant. Now, obviously, some big chunk of those are Android phones. And yeah. you can make the argument that some big chunk of those are not necessarily being used you know, for Google Assistant. But um, it's a fact that uh, the Google Assistant market size is bigger than that of the Amazon Alexa. It's also a fact that it kind of doesn't matter because these things are the dominant big two for this. Um, and even kind of minor players like Bixby and Siri uh, continue to be super important. And I think that one of the nice things is that no matter which one you choose, especially if you choose the big two, uh, you're, you're essentially ensuring yourself with 100% compatibility across all the smart devices and services and so forth that are available and are going to become available in the years ahead. So um, I, I think this is... Um, I think it's indisputable. You know, when you look at um, platform waves, you know, PC to mobile... This is the next one, and it's and you know it's the next one because it's the market is actually bigger than it is for smartphones, and it's bigger because unlike with a smartphone, we're going to be using multiple entry points for these assistants, and you can use them as a child where you might not you might not give a child a smartphone yet because of whatever age they are, but they'll still be interacting with smart devices around your house. Um, so that's a big deal. I think that's a big part of CS too. Um, TVs, anything big with TVs? I know that I know that Vizio I, said that they're. They're fixing 4K. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what. Fixing 4K. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not paying attention to the phone, the TV stuff. I, I don't, obviously there's 8K, there's QLED, there's, you know, there's all these different technologies, but um, I think TV is in a holding pattern right now. I think 4K HDR is the sweet spot. It's affordable for everybody, basically. Uh, certainly everybody, you know, listening to this. I mean, everyone in the United States or Western Europe. Um TV, you know, the screen size is going up, you know, quality is going up, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is the same thing with any platform. It's about uh, content or apps. 
and uh, there is no such thing as 8K content. <laughs> so um, the nice thing about 4K is we're going to be upsizing the 4K uh, content from the past for a long time to come. And as that kind of happens, um, you know, the things you already own maybe or things you might have bought in the past and will buy again are going to get better. You know, yeah. I did completely randomly watched an interview with the guy that made The Exorcist. And he said at the time, this is probably five or seven years ago, he said, you know, they they just converted it to Blu-ray. When they did it, they they went back to the original, which is film. And and he says, I, he's like, I got to tell you, he goes, I was listening to this. And he's like, I made the movie. And it was like watching it for the first time because there were all these ambient sounds like birds or whatever and different scenes. He's like, I don't even remember hearing any of that stuff. And it was just never, you know, because we had enjoyed this movie on video for so many years, it was just not part of the experience. But, you know, one of the nice things about going to the 4K uh format and all and, and all the things that go around that is that uh this stuff is suddenly there you know it's good so this is not new content but it is kind of new con content yeah. you know it's nice yeah very interesting uh paul so let's talk about this glass dermis side you have it uh mm -hmm. so do i it, it, you need to get yours installed so here's the deal i just yeah. real quick because i know this is you should really be talking about this thing not yeah. me but um, my house is unique because the heat in my house is electric so uh, that's not good, by the way. I don't live in Florida. The heat um, in your so it's house is electric. Right. And that okay. has a number of side effects. But one of them is that there's no such thing as a central control for heat in the house. Instead, we have a thermostat in every single room. And I mean, literally, we have dozens of these things. In every uh, room. That's good. In every room. So it's nice because if I want my office to be 80 degrees or something, I don't. But if I did, I could set it at 80. And my room would be 80. And the rest of the house would be whatever the setting is, 68 or something. Um, the bad side is <laughs> someone may put up the heat in one room and you kind of forget it because you don't visit the room for a while. And it's just sitting there cranking heat into a room and it's ponderous to go and change the temperature everywhere. So when you look at the glass thing, we have two, uh, controls, one upstairs, one downstairs for a air conditioning. We, one of them is digital. It's fairly recent. The other one's that old fashioned, you know, the analog mm -hmm. dial thing that everyone had or still has. Um, that only controls AC. So if I replaced anything in my house, it would be that, and it would only control AC. And it, it, you know, it's not useless, but it's it's just a weird fact of my house that it wouldn't be a great solution. We tried to do it, by the way. Um, you could depending wire. on your wiring, what's in the wall, yeah. the different setup. You know, you looked at the, you did it. Um, they give you a, a C wire converter, like an adapter. Uh, we had to do that yeah. for mine because the, for whatever yeah. reason, the the first floor only has two wires, but every other floor has more than two wires. It has like four wires. So yeah. every other floor would have worked except for the one that I wanted to put it on. This, this so complexity is a huge problem with, um, uh, I would say, with this technology being adopted, right? Um, when you put a smart speaker in your house, it's fine. You just plug it in. It works, you know? Um there's some complexity to this. And in my case, what I had, my brother and I, Aunt Laura and I tried to do it, but what we really, what I would really need is to hire an electrician to come yeah. in and do it right. You know? Yeah. So and luckily for me, I had a, um, we were demo in the house. So I had the electrician there. I'm like, you right. want to put this thing in? He's like, holy crap. What is this? <laughs> I was like, it's a therm thermostat. Uh, so what I did today, I recorded a little video. So I'm going to talk over it. Uh, that'll make, it a little bit easier for us to um, to do. So I'm going to mute the audio. Paul, actually, how do I do this, John? Because Oh, there we go. It's already muted. So I'm going to mute the audio, and I'm going to talk over it, and I'm going to give you guys a little example of what I'm doing while I am, um, I guess we're doing the show. So here we go. So this is it. Uh, this is the glass thermostat. So it's absolutely beautiful. To begin with, this yeah. is what you see and when you walk up. that's in your house, so it's just sitting this, there working. Yeah, just sitting there working. So when you walk up, it turns on, so you see the display. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a showpiece. Everybody says, you know, what is this? They want to know about it. So I think that's a really cool factor of the device, and that's glass. I mean, it's actually transparent. If I put my hand behind it, you could actually see it. So that's how you turn the heat on, obviously, up, down. Uh, the wiring was not that difficult. Uh, if you have the proper wiring, you could do it very easily by yourself. Uh, these are the settings. So obviously you could just turn it off. If you want to turn it off, you could obviously I have it on a hot on heat. Uh, the other side here is where a lot of the information is. So this is awesome. So you can see the temperature in the house. You can see the temperature outside of the house, the forecast, the energy saving that you're doing by having this device. I have, n I'm not good at programming it. 
So you could see that on Monday, by the way, it was 20 something degrees. So I used a lot of heat and I'm not using it. So it's actually cool to see the trends right there on the device. You don't need your phone to see that. I think that's a benefit right. for a lot of people. Some people don't want to take their phone out and do this. So uh, you could see it right there. Um, that that's the percentage used. Generally, it's around 10% energy saved for me. I don't know. The last couple of weeks, it's been 2% because I'm not scheduling things. I was fiddling with it and I had to restart it. That is my favorite feature, the air quality. Generally, in my house, it says poor. My air quality is absolutely terrible unless I'm running my air purifier. What mean? What's poor? Uh, like what, what is... What's poor? Like what's... so, it's test, it's testing for allergens. It's testing for a whole bunch. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff that it tests for, uh, for okay. the air quality. Generally, this is for people with central air conditioning. So it tells you to t or a fan to turn on the fan to kind of exhaust the room, the house. The air just sits in my house with the dust. Um, a lot of times it says bad. That's a scheduler again. I'm really crappy at it. Uh, I don't <laughs> do the scheduler, but it's a beautiful interface. And by the way, the, the, what is this running in the background, Paul? This device. I think it's uh, Windows IoT, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's the mic. So if you don't want Cortana to listen to you, you could turn it on or off. Uh, I generally leave it on. I don't care. And sometimes she Who's yells at me. Who's that swarthy-looking gentleman I can see reflected <laughs> yeah, in it? I don't know. That, that's a feature. Uh, you could turn to... That, that's the uh, display settings, the internet, the notifications, and the settings. Uh, the settings is where things get a little bit detailed. You could go in there, and uh, you could just fiddle around. Obviously, you get, you get the idea of what the... UI is. Uh, this also works with Alexa and Google Home. I have yet to program right. it with my Google Home. I had it with my Alexa for about a week when I had it, and I mm -hmm. returned my my Alexa. So I got to talk about that actually after this. <laughs> okay. Uh, my my Echo show, not my Alexa. Um, temperature settings. I mean, you could essentially set this to however you want. It shows you right. how to wire it also, which is cool on the device. So it gives you all the options for wiring. The wiring is right on that bottom panel that I'm touching right there, that silver piece. Everything goes right into that. So it's really flush. What was on your wall before you got this? Like, what was there? Nothing. Nothing there. On oh, the nothing. other side oh, was... An, oh, that's nice. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was an old thermostat on the other side. So there was nothing on this little wall. Nice. Uh, because it was just built out. Uh, notifications, which is great. You could set up the notifications. I don't turn on because I don't have central air conditioning. I don't need a service reminder. Uh, so I just mm -hmm. keep the indoor temperature uh, safety range, which is cool. If, God forbid, something goes wrong or the uh, the indoor air quality, which is always fair or poor for me because my house is miserable with that stuff. Uh, vacation settings, support. You could do a firmware update, which is great. So overall, this is a really cool device um, that I really like. Uh, I, I And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you... The, Number one reason why I really love this is the aesthetics of it. People see this thing and they go, my God, what is this? Oh, immediately. Because I don't think a lot of people have seen, you know, essentially uh, a display projected on glass like that. Uh, this is something still very new to, uh, to most people. Most people see a thermostat. They're thinking either, you know, I had an old school mercury thermostat upstairs, upstairs in the attic that I replaced. So they're not thinking uh high end like that or they think the nest which is just, which is a circle and you turn it like that um there is a lot of competition in this market and i think this year it's going to really become a, a main thing i i really like the device uh because it gives me stats and i'm a big stat junkie and i want to see trends and i want to kind of control the electricity in my house and the gas you know the my my electric and gas bill for people who don't know and i think i've told paul my gas and electric combined in let's say February, we'll hit fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's mostly my gas bill. It's not my electric bill. It's my gas bill. So to be able to have something like this that I could kind of you know modify and change, um, is is really good. So something interesting here that I like over the Nest. I have a Nest on my second floor. Um, the Nest for whatever reason for me, uh, it could be a setting thing. It's not as smart out the box to determine what it should put the heat to when I have it set to, you know, determining to turn the heat on or off. What it does, it, it shuts it to 50 all the time. It won't go to like 65. I know it's a manual setting, but I kind of like the out-of-the-box concept of things, and I want to try it for a little bit. This one out-of-the-box knows when to turn the heat off or turn the heat on. Yeah, It's, it's a little bit smarter in that case. Um, it, it, there, I have had a couple of glitches, but it was fixed by a firmware update. 
overall, I think this is a really cool device. And I'm interested to see what the next step for them is with something like this, with firmware updates or even a second gen. Because the potential is endless with the, the stats that it offers. I kind of would like to see more of the... Um, uh, how it tells me the the allergens in my house and things like that. I kind of want that a little bit more detailed. Uh, but it has been cool since I have that molecule air purifier, Paul. I, mm-hmm. Whenever I run that thing, my air quality goes to great. And when I don't run it, because right now it's in the basement, uh, it, it goes to fair or poor, which is very interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. I would say consider it. If you are looking for a smart device, a smart thermostat, uh, and th- uh, this is the prettiest one, in my opinion, on the market. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I would I would definitely consider this. At the end of the day, you're turning the heat on, you're turning the heat off, you're programming stuff. You could go, and, and if you don't care about these things, this isn't going to be necessarily the device that you put in your house. But if you kind of like the technology aspect, you like Cortana, you want to control it with Alexa, this is definitely a, 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 a consideration you should make because it's yep. it's really pretty. It's a really nice device. What'd you think, Paul? Do you agree? Yeah. Yep. I, I, it's interesting how long this thing took to come to market. Um, yeah. I think it was first revealed in October or so of 2017. I didn't see it in person until it was CES last year. Do you think it's on the window it, side? That was on the window that? side of things that it took so long? No, 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 no. It was just uh, the company. What is it? Uh, who makes it? Johnson, Johnson. Controls controls yeah um no i don't think it had anything to do with microsoft uh it was just it's just it was kind of on a slow boil and you know because of what had happened with the cortana powered Harmon carton speaker there was some concern last year like is this thing actually going to happen you know yeah and then of course they announced uh, they would support both google assistant and alex and i thought okay there it's it's still going to happen it's fine and it's great that it did because it's a great obviously it's yeah. a great product it's neat so we're going to wrap it up. We're going to do a bonus show here uh, on YouTube. What we're going to start doing is doing the super chats. Uh, if super you guys chats. want to watch the bonus show uh, starting next week, we're going to do people could fund us on, on YouTube live as we're doing it. They could give us a couple points, a couple bucks. Uh, hmm. So we're going to start doing if you want to keep the show live, I'm going to leave it up to YouTube. If we get to like couple bucks in donations we'll do the show live if not then we're going to take it off the air and go to patreon exclusive we, we're trying new things here uh there's a little dollar sign on the bottom also we're going to be doing ga- a gaming show paul and i are planning this uh we're going to be doing a gaming show so that'll be funded by you guys exclusively and you guys decide what game we want to play uh how we're going to play it and uh how drunk we're going to get going to do that also people are criticizing me how hot my house is i keep my house at 65 this is because of the kids and my wife it's on 69 degrees it is way too hot in this house 69 i way too hot 68 68 no too normal. hot 65 i i keep it on 65 <laughs> i want the house freezing i want to walk around in a parka i want to be like a lady at a lunches with their with their mink walking around in the house that's what i want <sighs> So take it up with Jess. It's way too hot in this house. Uh, <laughs> that's how I'm, that's how I'm doing my marital complaints. I'm just telling the audience to tweet her at Jessica Zarian right. and yell at her when when I, I'm not happy with something. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna uh, today we're gonna keep the show live. Uh, starting next week, we're gonna leave it up to YouTube. If you guys want to have the show live, give us a couple bucks, and then we'll keep the show live. If not, then we'll just take it off and uh, go to Patreon. Guys, go to our website, gfqnetwork.com. Subscribe to the podcast. We're everywhere podcasts are available. Paul, therot.com. Everybody go to therot.com. You could become a Therot Premium member. Only a couple bucks a month. You could get all his exclusive stuff for uh, premium members like his articles, his podcasts, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, Patreon.com slash what the tech is where you go to fund us. Uh, all your dollars are... Um, are very much appreciated. You can follow me on Twitter at Andrew Zanny. You can follow Paul at The Rot, and we'll see you all next week. Take care.